I realized that I usually start my welcome words saying this is a very special evening. And then I find some reason. And usually I mean it. Uh, today it is a special evening of a special kind because uh, not only do I uh, welcome and welcome back a uh, dear colleague and friend and wonderful scholar here, but also because we are doing, for the first time, we will have an inaugural lecture that will be a kind of dialogue. And also one of the participants of the dialogue uh, will be Vivian Liska. So I <laughs> feel I have to take some distance from that and we will try to work out a way in which I can do that. Before doing that, however, I want to uh, thank the people who make all this possible and open officially the academic year of the Institute of Jewish Studies and this evening. So it is my pleasure to welcome you all to the 17th academic year of the Institute of Jewish Studies at the University of Antwerp. And it is also my pleasure to see that there are some people here who were here back then, 17 years ago. So, I'm sure you were here not long after. <laughs> I would like to start by thanking all those who have contributed uh, to the development of the Institute in those years and to the growing importance it has gained over the past years. In the first place, as always, the Ministry of the Flemish Community, Department of Education, which fully finances our institution. And having worked a lot with American institutions, I know that this is by no means evident that one doesn't have to do fundraising and actually does not depend on any kind of organization. So that guarantees us full academic freedom uh, and a certain kind of security to be able to plan long term. We are also most grateful to Rector Hermann van Houten, who has for many years provided strong support as board member of our institute and our Board of Directors and Scientific and International Advisory Committee should be thanked for their valuable and appreciated input and advice with regard to our activities. I would like to express my appreciation to the Institute's current doctoral fellows, Annelies Augustans, Sebastian Müngersdorf, and Hans van Ness, and the postdoctoral researcher, Caroline Vermeule. To my colleagues who offer courses in the context of the Institute, Dennis Barth, Paul Heibels, Aaron Malinsky, Karin Hofmeister, Julien Kleiner, and Jörg Kraus, a very sincere thank you. This year we welcome two experts already long acquainted with the Institute to our research team, Professor Kathleen Heisers and Professor Arvi Sepp. Lynn and Arvi, a warm welcome to you both. <coughs> Last but not least, I would like to thank our administrative coordinator, Jan Morens, for doing such a wonderful job. He has, over the past six years, become the Institute's indispensable pillar. The inaugural lecture of today marks the start of our weekly lecture series. These evening lectures are given by national and international scholars who will, as always, present a wide range of topics within various disciplines of Jewish studies. Our program for this semester includes a three-day seminar on modern European culture and the Jews, in which Professor Steve Ashheim will examine some of the many intersections between European culture and the modern Jewish experience. On 16 November, we plan a special evening on Jewish music, including two book presentations and two lectures, one on music in the Jewish Bible and the other on <coughs> the Hebrew melodies. Also in November, there will be the international conference on the Austrian author Karl Kraus, Kraus' analysis of the first months of National Socialism. Before that, there will be an evening on Luther and the Jews in the context of the Luther year that we are organizing as uh, every year with the Uxia, the Jesuit institution 
And finally, there will be a seminar on Maurice Blanchot and Franz Kafka in December. You're all warmly invited to participate in these activities, lectures, conferences, language courses, and courses on Jewish studies. And you can find out more about our activities in the newsletter and on the website. So far, a little preview of the semester. About the lecture of tonight, I uh, just want to say for now that the idea emerged out of a conversation I had with Steve, Professor Arsheim. We are both uh, in the field of what is called German Jewish studies, and we are interested in similar figures, and we decided to turn this into, indeed, a kind of dialogue in which we will both present the different perspectives on German Jewish thought, asking the question, <coughs> the question of the title of this lecture, the actuality, what does this thought have to say to us today, what is the origin of the importance of these thinkers, and these thinkers are the big names of 20th century thought, especially thought about modernity, we will ask the question of its past. What was it? What does it mean today? And what is its future? Steve, I now leave the floor to you. Um, Bobian is not telling the full truth. <laughs> uh, the full truth is that um, we actually are here as a kind of celebration. And we are here to celebrate something that Vivian didn't even mention, uh, which is her book uh, on German Jewish thought as being a tenuous legacy, which is a splendid book. I don't know if it's in Flemish or in French or in any other language. Uh, it should be. Um, it's a path-breaking book, and we were supposed to have a dialogue. But the point about Vivian's book is that she basically makes what I say irrelevant. Hey. So, um, what, what uh, her book is trying to say is that of the intellectuals that I claim are so central and became iconic in Western culture over the last few years, their very work has been deeply challenged. And so, whereas my work is now dated, uh, Vivian's is completely updated. So, before I say my updated words, my outdated words, um, I also, and my wife Hanno, who's sitting in the back here, uh, have to thank, first of all, Jan, who managed single-handedly to take up two suitcases up an absolutely impossible Belgian staircase, <laughs> which is, I have never seen anything quite like it in my life. <laughs> managed single-handedly to take it, and for all his help and his cooperation, which is great. As for Vivian, it's, it really hurts me to say such nice things, but it's all true. <laughs> Um, she has not only made an institution here, but she's made a remarkable impact in Jerusalem, which is where I also teach, uh, with a massive network of connections, uh, people who love and respect her, and, and Vivian herself has become an internationally renowned scholar. I wish her driving was as good as her scholarship. <laughs> Um, but at any rate, uh, it's a great thank you to Vivian for, uh, for the invitation and for the, uh, for the dialogue. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, radically cut my text because the question that was posed was why were a certain group of German Jewish intellectuals so very, very central and important in, West, and important in Western intellectual culture 
Between, I would say, from the 1970s on, I'll come to who I'm talking about, um, whereas Vivian's book now is demonstrating how their work is being thoroughly challenged. But because their work is being thoroughly challenged, I would argue, that proves their centrality remains, which gives my talk some vague validity. <laughs> In which case, uh, I'm really talking here about a certain kind of intellectual legacy. And you know, the whole history of German Jewry, there's a kind of tug of war. One part of it claims that German Jewry is a history of failed assimilation, of deluded self-images, unaware of what was happening around them. The other is that of a unique intellectual legacy. And I'm really going to talk about what I consider to be that unique intellectual legacy. Now, I'm not talking in huge generalities. I'm not talking, for instance, about seven or eight of my bar mitzvah books. The bar mitzvah books all said, these were all Jews. And then you had Freud, you had Einstein, you had Marx, you had uh, Kafka, all of them. And then you say, oh, I'm very proud. Uh, I mean something much more specific. That is to say, a group of particular intellectuals who during a certain period of time came to be central in what we call Western intellectual culture. I'll name the names. Theodore Adorno. I think I did this in alphabetical order, not in order of whom I prefer. I'll tell you later whom I prefer. Theodore Adorno. Hannah Arendt, Walter Benjamin, Franz Rosenzweig, Gershom Scholem, and Leo Strauss. All of these as particularly important at a particular stage uh, of uh, their life. I don't think I need to tell you about each one of them very briefly. There was a period during the uh, <coughs> Iraq war, if you remember, that Leo Strauss, this very small, shy kind of fellow, was seen as the evil demon behind the Iraqi war, behind the Bush doctrine of invading Iraq. Now, you may or may not like Strauss, but you cannot deny that this is a man of intellectual influence if he is held to have created the Iraq war. Secondly, Hannah Arendt. Uh, she has become so well known that indeed there is, I Probably you have been on it, you know, or there was a train called the Hannah Arendt Express that went from Karlsruhe to Hannover. And if you haven't done that, perhaps you've sent a letter with a postal stamp of Hannah Arendt. So she, and of course, very controversially, there is the Hannah Arendt Straße right next to the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin. So as to influence, I don't think that's open to question. Um, in fact, many people claim, I think Zizek is one of them, that Hannah Arendt had much to do with the East European Velvet Revolution in the 1970s and 80s. Walter Benjamin. <clears throat> Walter Benjamin has become a virtual industry. He has, if you, uh, there is one test now. And please don't take out your cell phones. But the test is Google. Google Walter Benjamin and you will see there, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of entries. So as to his influence, um, he has moved not only from highbrow culture but also into very pop culture. I think there are two or three now, I'm not quite sure. Rock bands named together with or about Benjamin. Um, there is, uh, as far as I know, he is the only one of the intellectuals who has a monument built to his memory uh, after his suicide uh, in Port Bou by the Israeli sculptor Dani uh, Karavan. Then, of course, there is Theodor Adorno, and the Frankfurt School really took off uh, during this period. Um, somebody asked, should we adore Adorno? 
I'm not sure that I do, but nevertheless, that is the question. Or to make a very bad pun, I call him at times Adonolam, but nevertheless. <laughs> then, of course, two intellectuals, one certainly achieved international fame, and that's Gershom Scholem, who transversed all of these borders uh, and became extremely well known for his originality, his immense learning, uh, and so on and so forth. In fact, he's been compared by some people to, to Freud. And then, of course, there is Franz Rosenzweig, perhaps the least internationally known, but by philosophers more and more recognized in terms of great originality. So, the question that I have to ask here is, how do we account for the fact that in the mid-70s, till recently, a group of ex mostly exiles, the only one who was not exiled was Franz Rosenzweig, who died tragically in 1929, a bunch of German Jewish intellectuals exiled from Germany, refugees from Nazism. Of course, Benjamin died early, but he was in exile, a refugee. What accounts for that fact that they became so important and so relevant? Well, I suppose in one way it is a kind of idealization after the Holocaust, a kind of commemoration. But I think it goes uh, well, well uh, before that. Also, these people became very popular, I don't know about in Belgium, I'm talking here above all in America. And in America they have the aura of being European. Now it may shock you to hear that for Americans, Europeans are deep. Sometimes they are incomprehensible, but they are deep. And so they are seen as quintessential European thinkers. But above all, they are seen as a special type, a distinctive, separate kind of intellectual who were Jews. And as Walter, Walter Benjamin himself put it, I quote, Jewishness is not in any sense an end in itself, but Jewishness is the noble bearer and representative of the intellect. That is Benjamin's term. There is also a kind of aura of the Weimar Republic. Let's forget the issues and the, the social <coughs> tensions. But there is also the myth of the Weimar Republic as being one in which there was radical literary, political, intellectual experimentation and excitement. And these people represent that. Why? Well, you couldn't have, although it's become, becoming true again, which other Weimar intellectuals could become idolized? You couldn't then, although it's become thinkable now, have people like Ernst Junger, Karl Schmidt, and Heidegger as your intellectual heroes. Our people, if you like, were untouched, at least uh, in terms of the Nazi background, even though at times, and I'm not going to speak about this now, uh, at times, uh, Leo Strauss came pretty close to fascism, but never Nazis. So, all of them basically moved, went beyond borders. So their perspectives were those of being at home and being outside of home, giving them some kind of uh, double perspective. Um, uh, in effect, uh, uh, what... what uh, Terry Eagleton put this about Benjamin. He is the dialectical Jew at a standstill, decla declaring the small hoarse sound of the Torah in the custom shed. Now one can argue that these people really remained uh, Europeans till the end, uh, and Walter Lacour, in his usual ironic way, has declared that these people had a very narrow view of American society because none of them learned how to drive a car, <laughs> which is also a, a possibility. So, um, this doesn't really take us that far. The question is, for instance, why did Rosenzweig and Scholem become so much more popular later 
than Martin Buber. Why is it that Arendt and Strauss became much more popular than Ernst Cassirer or Hermann Cohen? Why, for instance, do we hear so much more about Adorno and Benjamin and much less about Ernst Bloch and even Herbert Marcuse? Marcuse was very, very popular and then kind of went away. So what, what's really uh, behind all of this? Well, I think in a way, Buber looks too saintly now. He is too pontificatory. Um, and by the way, part of his reputation was totally messed up by Scholem himself, which, which we shouldn't forget. Hermann Cohen and Ernst Cassirer, whom I admire tremendously, were basically neglected because they are too classically liberal. Whereas our thinkers are not liberals. They are challenging liberalism. They were seen to be too liberal and too bourgeois. And Marcuse and Bloch, well, they are activists. They were too participatory. Whereas you have Adorno and Benjamin who have tortured kind of gyrations about the impossibility of realizing something, about deferring things about the Messiah, but the Messiah is not coming. So it is much more textual and much less activist uh, than these uh, other thinkers. So, um, what I am arguing here is, and it's not just post-Holocaust, we tend to forget, most of us were not alive, but historians know, that the trauma of World War I brought about a massive change, a sense of crisis. We have swamped it by our post-Holocaust. <coughs> but post-World War I inaugurated immense rethinking about crisis. So I would argue, first of all, all of these people engaged in post-Weimar, post-liberal ruminations, believing that the old order on which, at which they had been raised had collapsed that the, the order of things no longer answered needs and was viable. I don't want to say now that we're living in a similar situation. I think we are approaching that. But at this stage, <coughs> what they wanted to do was saying, given this crisis, we need a root rethinking of things. Start at the bottom and start rethinking things in such a way that we have to aid understand what has happened to European and Jewish civilization, that's number one, and secondly, try to provide radical solutions for that predicament. So, uh, I, if, if you like, uh, Adorno and Benjamin kind of reconceive Western Marxism through a humanistic eye. Hannah Arendt analyzes totalitarianism, but she's also arguing for a kind of post-metaphysical politics after what has happened. Rosenzweig, even though he is about the tradition, but he is about redefining how one comes to the tradition. <coughs> he has a different kind of, of philosophy from, let's say, the Orthodox Jews. He comes to orthodoxy, but he does it in a post-Hegelian existentialist way. Gershom Scholem, well, he was animated by a kind of theological, metaphysical dream of the regeneration of Judaism. Kabbalah comes into it, and he brings into Jewish history, into the center, the most radical fringe groups, who he says are the creative fountains of Jewish life, even the Sabbateans the Frankists. So he's, he's writing a kind of transgressive, underground history of Judaism in the hope of refounding what normally has been seen uh, uh, in this way. Leo Strauss um, rereads classical texts against liberalism and against modernity, and he goes back to a medieval kind of rationalism. Uh, and in effect, or his whole life, by the way, is an argument between Athens uh, and Jerusalem. So, 
They are all facing massive crisis. World War I, which is a general crisis, not a Jewish crisis. But at the same time, we all know what happens after 1918 in Europe and especially in Germany. With the rise of anti-Semitism, all of them are forced to or desire to come to terms with their own, what, what Strauss called their Jewish theological predicament. And that entailed, in one way or another, coming to terms with their complex, ambiguous, hybrid Jewish identity. Now, there's nothing surprising about this, but what is surprising, given the fact that now Zionism is seen as a reactionary movement by so many people, that with the exception of Adorno, all of these people flirted with Zionism. Because at that stage, if you wanted to be radical, if you wanted to go against the, the bourgeoisie, if you like, you could go to Marxism or you could go to Zionism. And these people, in one way or another, all flirted with what today seems a kind of strange choice. So, um, and by the way, this revolt against the, the parents and the bourgeoisie is very clear. If you want to learn more about it, you should go to Vivian Liska's class on Kafka and reread the letter to the father, where it's quite clear. So, I've got to rush on. Um, you see how, how mercifully I am doing this here. Skipping and skipping. Um, so they were all engaged, if you like, again, in some way in dealing with their own Jewish predicament. But for me, and this is for me most interesting, and I think the most important, because of their own personal Jewish conflicts, almost all of them were driven to deal with a much more general and radical problem. That is, dealing with the question of the Western tradition as a whole. So it wasn't just their own Jewish predicament, it was something far larger. Again, to quote Vivian's uh, great author, Franz Kafka, he called writing an assault against the frontiers. All of them were, if you like, moving uh, against what were traditionally accepted as norms. Um, Rosenzweig, for instance, envisioned a Judaism of national belonging and redemption that had nothing to do with place. By the way, he, I said they all flirted with Zionism. It's interesting. Rosenzweig was not a Zionist. But it's very interesting. All the people he was communicating with and arguing with were Zionists. So he was part of that, that kind of group. Surely, what does he do? He, he questions the very uh, centrality of halakha, or of Jewish normative law, and he's always concerned what is the fine line between religion on the one hand and nihilism on the other. In fact, what he called Zionism at the beginning, as it's a life lived without illusions at the boundary. So all of them, I, will, I would argue, at this stage, were presenting Western audiences much later with some kind of an, an alternative, arguing that there was no possibility of an unmediated return after those wars, both the first and the second, an impossibility to return to either the German, the European, or the Jewish tradition. Something new, something alternative had to be created. They all sought novel and unexpected ways for reconfiguring these traditions and finding some new modes of relating uh, to, to, their, to the new issues when the authority had, came, had come into uh, question. So that basically um, I would call in many ways, their basic attraction. They were also attractive at the time because these people came pretty close to postmodernism, which, thank goodness, is now declining like the rest of the Western world. <laughs> um, 
By the way, Oswald Spengler has become again extremely popular, we are, which is quite stunning. I told David here that, that they've just translated Spengler again, not again, for the first time, into Dutch. So, what, 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 I'm, what I'm fundamentally uh, arguing here is, they all resembled, or in fact even kind of helped foster postmodernism in the sense that all were masters of interpretation and textuality. They all have very dense, paradoxical, even esoteric modes of writing. And because they assaulted given frontiers and they accentuated rupture, they were against positivism, against histori historicist reason, and so on. But there is a big difference. The difference between them and the postmodernists is in this. That instead of celebrating the death of tradition, they mourn the death of tradition. They are longing for some relation to tradition, even though it is not accessible to them. So what I'm saying here, in a way, there is still, unlike the real postmodernists or the, the po let's call them that, there is a longing for ultimacy, for realization which may not come. Now I've said, um, I'm going to end here, as I want Vivian to be talking. I said at the beginning, though, that there is a problem. The problem, this I wrote some years ago. And even then I sensed it, but I sense it now even more. We are all, why do I study these figures, Vivian asked me yesterday. Because they're really interesting. Because they're really radical because they go beyond. But would I trust them with my children? No! <laughs> because that radicalism has a price. And if German Jews were post-liberal, it is true they maintained some of the Enlightenment, they maintained some of the reason, but almost all their writings are directed against liberalism. And, and now I put on my rabbinical hat and do my preaching bit and say that if anything is challenged today and if anything maintains its value, it's liberalism. That is how Jews have prospered and that is how, please God, they will continue to prosper. And so my, what, I'm, what I'm arguing here is perhaps growing older, we need both. You need the radical questions. You need those like Adorno who says morality is never to be at home at home. But I think too that it is time to bring back thinkers like Hermann Cohen and Ernst Cassira who took humanism and liberalism much more seriously than our other antinomian thinkers. Thank you very much. Steve, many thanks, many thanks for giving the, uh, this most insightful uh, core introduction to why these figures matter so much, have mattered so much, and will or maybe will not matter in the future, which is uh, what I will be turning to. First of all, yes, we uh, discussed these topics for many years and particularly discussed them uh, a few months ago when we decided to share this discussion with you because in some ways we uh, do agree and in others we agree less. And this is what we wanted to present to you. When I heard you now, I realized first of all how much it's something I knew and I knew it when I uh, wrote my book, uh, that you were indeed, uh, and you are and remain, a pioneer of 
what now has become a field, German Jewish studies. It has become a field and it gained contours thanks to uh, a few scholars who, like you, uh, actually ask these <coughs> questions. Why these questions matter? I think that uh, you uh, pointed to the core of it, namely what I call the tensions in these thinkers, and here we fully agree. Uh, they were on the threshold of so many things that still preoccupy us today. For example, uh, the tension between particularism and the universal, between individualism and communitarianism, between the tradition and modernity and not wanting to let go in each case of one of them and coming up with very complex alternatives to being either a total rationalist or irrational, to being uh, uh, either a Marxist or a bourgeois. Uh, in, in each case, they found alternative ways. And if they were so complex in their writings, so complicated and often, as I argue in my book, so uh, some things remain unresolved, remain contradictory. And that has indeed preoccupied interpreters all the way to, to, till today, precisely because there are, there are things that remain contradictory and, uh, and unresolved. So uh, this, I think, has given inspiration and food for uh, thought uh, to generations of readers, of students, of scholars, and what interests me most uh, in my book, to other thinkers and philosophers. And uh, there we, uh, we part ways, or rather we open a discussion and a dialogue. So we do agree on one of the core reasons of their importance, these, these tensions. Also their complexity, as well as the radicalism in complexity. Now that is not a small feat. Uh, to achieve that. Where we uh, tend to take things from different angles, you, in general, in your, in your book and uh, in your thinking, you are mainly interested in the Jewishness of these <coughs> thinkers, in their Jewish identity. What I tried to do, what interested me, and that is probably more contentious, more problematic. I was looking for traces of the Jewish tradition of Judaism in the thinking of these figures. Jews, they were and they affirmed their Jewishness openly, sometimes surprisingly openly. And I have a series of quotes to illustrate this. Just to take up some of them, and I have two others. So uh, this is Arendt, Benjamin, Kafka, and Parzela. So we have not completely the same uh, canon of, uh, of these thinkers, but they are certainly all of that field. And so here, I've always regarded my Jewishness as one of the indisputable factual data of my life. Thus, Jüdische is always, this is Benjamin, is always self-understood. Everything Jewish that gone beyond the self-evidence seems dangerous. My Jewishness is self-evident. Kafka. Then there is the question of being Jewish. You are asking me if I'm a Jew? Maybe that's just a joke. And Parzellan, the self-evidence of my Jewishness in the midst of it all. You, Ilana, it was his lover at the time, understand it even as I know now no longer know how to formulate it. So beyond conceptualizing, beyond saying even what this is exactly, there is no doubt, no question, and they present it as self-evident, which is also striking when you look at the complexity of the way in which, once they start thinking about Jewish matters, how complicated it becomes. But there is a kind of bottom line to affirming their Jewishness. What interests me in my book is something that addresses not so much their Jewish identity 
as really traces of Judaism in their work. Now, why is that more problematic? Because with the exception of Gershom Scholem, they didn't have all that much of knowledge. Not my, fig my figures, unlike Franz Rosenzweig, unlike Hermann Cohen, unlike uh, well, who else have you have you mentioned? Not Kassir is not, not no not Kassir. Um, okay, okay Sholem of course, who I I'm dealing with as well, or Martin Buber, right? They know the Jewish tradition. The figures who interest me, Walter Benjamin, Hannah Arendt, even Theodor Adorno, Kafka, Celan, they had very limited knowledge of the Jewish tradition. So. How can it be justified to go and look for traces? And I argue this in my book in three ways. One, it is precisely because they did not have a thorough knowledge. They represent the possibility in modernity, or not so much the possibility, you can find in their work what it is that remains, what is it that one can that is inspiring to take over into modernity. Even when one has left the Lea house, one has left the yeshiva, what is it that, and how can one bring it into modernity? It is precisely because there are only traces left. What are these traces? Walter Benjamin gives this a beautiful image. He speaks about the sparks and splinters that have survived and that can survive into modernity. But these sparks and splinters that come from the Jewish tradition, they ought to be, he talks about it in a way, activated. They have to be, uh, they, they, they have to be yeah, illuminated so that they point toward what Benjamin talks about as a kind of messianic possibility, a messianic force that is there in every generation, including in modernity, as a kind of hope for a eventual redemption. So what these sparks and splinters interest me in my book, and I go to these thinkers and look for them. I look for them in terms of elements of the Jewish tradition that are indisputably central to it, such as the law, halakha, the question of exile, not only as something, and here we come close in some ways, not only as an experience of the Jew in exile, but also as a concept. As a concept that is already there in the Bible, that starts from the notion of being expelled from paradise, so that the whole of humanity in some ways is in exile, but uh, in parentheses, there is, it's very interesting that if you go to the Torah and you see how exile is being discussed, on the one hand, yes, you can say that all men are in exile, but then we find much later when we come to the curses, what will happen to the Israelites if they don't follow the word of God, they will be expelled and outcast and will have to come to live among other people. Among, stranger, among strangers. So there it is clearly a political idea of exile. It's not an existential or even metaphysical notion of exile. But it is a very specific one and a specific notion of Jewish exile. So just to enumerate what, in what areas I am looking uh, when I look for these traces that survive from Judaism. The law, exile, messianism, the very idea of waiting for redemption, of feeling the insufficiency of this life here and now, either from a, uh, let's say, secular perspective that doesn't believe in another other world, or from a Christian perspective that believes that there is a way in which the Savior has come already. But that attitude of waiting, the attitude of deferral that has been translated in modernity into all kinds of Marxist utopias uh, or 
general ways of looking into the future and situating the uh, redemption there. Another very complex and uh, problematic notion is the notion of being elected. The elected people. What have these thinkers done with that? Well, they have in some ways also transformed this into notions for, of modernity that election is not something that uh, somehow puts uh, a people or an individual as superior but as having an uh, additional responsibility for others for the world. So these are examples of areas that come from Judaism that have been transformed by these thinkers. That uh, is that was my my uh, task for in this book to show how imp how importantly they have they have become uh, key figures for modernity as such away from Judaism. But Judaism has inspired their core thinking. The second aspect that um, is, differs from, uh, from your approach is that I became indeed interested in the reception of these figures, in the fate of their importance, not only to postmodernism but until today. And in my book I discuss how these figures, and particularly the Jewish dimension of these figures, and maybe even more, the Jewish, more than the Jewish dimension, this tension that I'm talking about between the Jewish on the one hand and modernity on the other, how that has been dealt with by thinkers all the way till today. And I have discovered that indeed, and I'm quoting you in my book for saying that it is amazing how important and how prominent these figures are all the way until today, this is true both in terms of their general popularity and of a certain scholarly popularity. There are <coughs> uh, endless conferences and books and articles and discussions about these figures. But I was going, I was looking at who their successors are who still refer to them. So figures who are today in the philosophical discourse who have taken their place, let's say. And the figures I have discovered, and I will skip, so in my book I do this in three stages. The first are these German Jewish modernist thinkers, the second are the postmodernists, the thinkers of the late 20th century, and the third are the figures of the turn into the 20th century, who are all still alive today. And I looked at how they refer to these to Aaron, to Benjamin, how they use them, how they discuss them, how they value them. And what I discovered is that in the, in the postmodern context, they are still very valued, although what is being done to the Jewish aspect of their thinking becomes, I would say, becomes vague and metaphorized. Uh, the Jew is the exile, the nomad, the wanderer, and it doesn't necessarily need to be really a Jew. It can be, as uh, Jean-François Lyotard says, it can be a Jew in quotation marks. A Jew in quotation marks who is no longer written with a capital letter, but with a small letter, and is contrasted to the Jew with a capital letter and without quotation marks, who is, so to say, the real <coughs> Jew. And for Lyotard, the real Jew is a bad Jew, a bad nomad, because he insists on his identity, he insists on his belonging. So you see, that is, in the postmodern context, there is this, this metaphorization takes place. But, so one can explain this as a desire to actually universalize these and to the, the 
tension and often the contradiction that one finds in those earlier figures is being resolved by, well, in, in two ways, and one is more complicated. The one way is to metaphorize it, and when you metaphorize the Jew, the contradiction gets dissolved because it can be, it becomes valid, generally valid. The other way is more complicated. I said that the, all these tensions were unresolved, not all, and, but there are some of the core tensions, such as the one between particularism and universalism, that was unresolved in those figures. The unresolvedness, so leaving things open, that is what becomes in postmodernism what it's all about. And that is then called Jewish. But it is Jewish in a metaphorical way. So it is, a, and then one often has referred to the Talmud as this endless and open discussion that does not come to any conclusion. And that is a, you know, very, that can be harmonized with, uh, so the Talmudic tradition and the Talmudic tradition of interpretation that doesn't come to a closure that is the unresolved and in that way uh, leads leads the post into postmodern thought. It is not what interested me primarily, what interested me most were these thinkers of today, because this is where my book started when I realized that there is some real change that occurred in the past um, 20 <laughs> years, 20, 30 years. Who are the thinkers of today? I will mention them. Yes, I will mention them, and uh, I will. This is uh, what I want to do now: is briefly tell you about this, give you a few examples, and give you a textual example uh, of how the one of the core texts of this tradition has been interpreted by a postmodern thinker and by a contemporary thinker. And I will close with that example. So, to sum up my, my argument, the argument of my book, you see that this is the cover of my book and this is the cover of Steve's book. <laughs> and The difference is indeed that at the center of it, you see that something is empty. And what I am, there is an empty core, and I will end my talk after having explained my thesis and given the example by explaining this emptiness. What I have discovered is that thinkers today, and I mention their names and will give examples, Giorgio Agamben, Alain Badiou, and Slavoj Žižek. They are referring still to this tradition. They go back and read Walter Benjamin, they read Hannah Arendt, they read Kafka, they read Zela. But they do that in ways that are, I believe, highly problematic to the extent to which one values this tradition. They do one of three things, and they do this differently. I am most interested in the one I find the most interesting thinker, Giorgio Agamben, who, um, who reads Benjamin, Scholem, Arendt, Kafka, Zelan. He reads them all. And then he divides them in two, and they're the good ones and the bad ones. And the good ones, they can be read from the perspective that he develops. What is this perspective, and what is the perspective that he shares with the two others? Now, quickly, the two others, they don't divide in that way, but they simply say that this whole um, tradition ought to be questioned in terms of its Jewishness. They may be interesting in some ways, but there where they invoke Judaism, either Jewishness 
or the Jewish tradition. And I will <coughs> come to that. Uh, one has to uh, one has to let go. One has to <coughs> forget, one has to dissolve, and I will give you examples of that. So, what is it that they have in common? They are all three invoking a figure who has been highly problematic for the Jewish tradition from the beginning, namely the Apostle Paul. They are all, and I speak in my book of the Pauline <coughs> turn, a turn in recent, uh, in recent decades to seeing in the Apostle Paul a model figure. Paul as the inventor of Christianity, but also as the one who said that uh, it, well, he said two things that have, that have been highly problematic for the Jewish tradition. The one, there are no more Jews and no more, there are no Jews and no Greeks because we are now all saved in Christ. All those who follow Christ are saved and these distinctions are dissolved. That's the one thing. Alain Badiou, most explicitly, but the others as well, called Paul the invention, the inventor, the one who has invented universalism. He has undone these particularist cultures, and he's the one who invented universalism. And those who today are hindering us from finding and establishing a true universalism are those who hold on to that kind of particular cultures. That's the one thing. The other thing that Paul claimed is that one no longer ought to follow the law, it's not the works, and by law he explicitly means the halakha, but now we are all, as we are in Christ, our actions and our thoughts ought to be dictated by love. It is not law, but love. The Jewish God is a law, uh, is a God of, uh, is a harsh God of justice, and the Christian God is a God of love. Now, what is it that makes a figure like Paul attractive for a post-postmodern thinker like George Agamben? George Agamben is a basically atheist, Christian anarchist. He's a critic of democracy, a critic of the establishment, a radical critic of liberalism. He finds the whole system is rotten and the only thing one can do is undo the law, undo state law, undo all law and celebrate anarchy. And for him, what Paul did to the Jewish law at the time is a model of how one ought to do away with the law today. And that will, in a way, bring a messianic redemption to our planet. Alain Badiou goes further, and uh, I, I don't know if I have the quote here, I will... Yeah, yeah. here. So, I will just uh, read the quote to illustrate this and then um, end on a very uh, concise example of how these figures have been read. But this, Alain Badin. So, this is the ending of a, of a text. These are three quotes that I've taken out from so, Alain Berdieu writes, if we have to create a new place, this is because we must create a new Jew. It's as simple as that. This comes at the end of a talk where he shows how problematic uh, Jewish particularism is, and at the end he has a solution. 
one has to create a new Jew. But this becomes clearer even, or the direction in which he goes in the second quote. His enemy figure is the SIT Jew. Now, I have to say that Alain Badiou, maybe you haven't heard from him, but uh, very much, in, I, was, uh, I was in Germany and I was told that in philosophy departments, he is the cult figure. So, here. SIT. Is he also not a communist? What? Is he not is also from the, the extreme left? I saw him once on the television. Absolutely. He's not the Maoist. He is a Leninist. He was a Maoist. He presents himself today as a Leninist, but of a special kind. Okay, so here. The tripod of what is the SIT Jew, the tripod of the Shoah, Israel, and the Talmudic tradition. When these three come together. This is the SIT Jew and these are the things that prevent the world from finding um, peace and from being redeemed in ways that he sees as a possibility that was shown by the Apostle Paul. So, the SIT Jew stigmatizes and exposes to public contempt anyone who contends that it is in all rigor possible to subscribe to a universalist and egalitarian sense of this word. The petty group of which we speak forms the intellectual extreme right wing of this deadly orientation. So the SIT Jew points to a deadly orientation. Its polemical practices belong to the various established genres of senseless repression. And then, uh, I know better, a thousand times better than the extremist fashion of the connection between the word Jew and the immense history of universal truth. So I know that the, the Jews did create universalism once. I know this. And that is why the SIT Jew uh, is the enemy. In liberating the word Jew from the triplet SIT, to which this faction tries, tries to reduce it, I associate myself amicably with the work undertaken by many others. And he refers very much to that tradition of thinkers that we've been talking about here. Now, this was one example. I give you, and I will end on that, one example <coughs> of a little story, and then I come to the end, I will close with an explanation of the cover of my book. The story is one of the most famous literary texts of the 20th century. It's called Before the Law, and it is by Franz Kafka. It is the story of a man from the country who comes to the law. It's a one-page story. A man from the country who comes to the law and seeks access to the law. There is a doorkeeper who doesn't allow him to enter. The man from the country sits at the entrance of the law, spends his whole life discussing with the doorkeeper, who says, you can, eventually you can come in, not now. And even if you would walk in, you would see that there are many, many other doorkeepers. They are discussing. I really keep it as short as possible. Toward the end, the man sits there all his life. Toward the end of his life, when his eyes are already very dim and it's getting dark, he sees a faint glimmer coming through the door from the law. At the end, the last sentence of the story, the man says, this door was only meant for you. I am now going to shut the door. And the man never has access to the door. This story has been interpreted in hundreds of ways. It has been interpreted as very often as the fate and the, the doorkeeper is a man with a long beard and has traits of a rabbinic authority. But I don't even want to go that far. It has been interpreted as the failure of modern man to have access to the divine law or to the truth. And he sits there and negotiates. It has been interpreted by um, 
from a Jewish perspective as a relationship to the law that doesn't necessarily require that he enter into the mm -hmm. law because the very negotiation with this authority is a mode of life in itself. Because entering the law, you know what, uh, Christ supposedly fulfilled the law once and for all. And that is why one could do away with the law after him. In Judaism, the man from the country still sits there and discusses with the rabbinic authority about the law and it is his way of relating to the law. This is in some ways still what inspired the postmodern thinker Jacques Derrida to, uh, of how he discussed this story. Because for him there is also no closure, no finality. I said before that the lack of closure, the inconclusiveness is what in postmodern... So for him that story of that endless negotiation up until the end of his life was something that was attractive and that very much coincides still with a certain structure of Jewish thinking. George Agamben came up with an amazing interpretation. One wouldn't have thought that one could still come up with a new interpretation of the story before the law today. Agamben says that one has always read this as a failure. Doesn't, can't enter the law. No, this is not a story of failure. This is the ultimate story of finally succeeding to get the door to the law to be shut. At the end of the story, the door gets shut and we are finally rid of the law. And the man from the country becomes, in, his own, in Agamben's own words, a kind of Christ figure. He is the Christ figure who, or at least a Pauline notion of a Christ figure, who finally gets the door to the law to be shut. So, this is just to give you an example of one postmodern and one contemporary singer. And now I will end on an explanation of my book cover. You see this empty center. I don't know if some of you recognize what this is. Do you know this? The painting on the cover of my book is uh, artwork by an American contemporary artist. And she was inspired by Paul Klee's Angelus Novus. It is one of the key uh, icons of our thinkers of German Jewish <coughs> It is not so much the painting, but the text that Walter Benjamin made of it. He sees in the angel, he calls it the angel of history, it's the Angelus Novus, but he called, Benjamin calls it the angel of history who, is, who turns his back to the future and looks back into the past, looks at history and sees one heap of rubble, one destruction, and would like to go back, to turn back, and reconstruct and uh, make the, the dead uh, uh, come alive again. And so there is a kind of messianic figure there in the face of the horrors of history that he wants to bring them back. And this was very often read in terms of the, uh, a kind of Jewish commemorate, commemoration that it is through looking at the past that we can bring about the a redeemed future. This has been read by Zizek and by Badiou. And I only have the shortest of quotes in a text in which he discusses indirectly Walter Benjamin's uh, story, this is what he writes. Ultimately, my twist is that this famous Benjaminian angel to which the title of the movie, I said indirectly because it is by a movie called Local Angels, is Christ himself. 
and but you this film local angel inspired by Benjamin's angel of history is not the god of glory and potency but wonderfully a weak and suffering god and then he says and the main inspiration for it is the and then he says Benjamin Sholem Shabtai Tzvi and the Apostle Paul. So now to end, and you've seen what makes me rather pessimistic about the philosophical survival and what brought me to use this painting <coughs> for the cover of my book. I will show you something that this artist discovered. Rebecca Quaitman, in the course of working on the Angel of His on the Angelus Novus by Clay, discovered that there was a, that there were two letters in the corner that nobody has ever questioned what that was. And she, with x-rays, tried to find what, what that is. And the letters were LC. And she came with, uh, with regular x-rays. One couldn't see through because it's painted on black. Uh, there was the angulus she discovered was painted on black printer's ink. So she asked for the help of the Israeli Museum, the Israel Museum in Jerusalem, where the painting, her painting now is, out of gratitude, she gave it to the Israel Museum, the painting that is on the cover of my book, because they helped her with a more sophisticated machine to discover what clay painted this Angelus Novus on. And that's what it is. It is Lukas Kranach's Luther. Now, why would that matter and how would that fit into my story? I believe that what is happening today uh, among these philosophers that I've talked about in terms of the German Jewish thinkers we discussed, there is a kind of supersessionism, an old story of uh, Christian dogma that after Christ and after the establishment of Christianity, Judaism has become irrelevant, it has become superfluous because it is all absorbed into Christianity. Now, in some ways, one could see in the story of the Angelus Novus, one could see that there is a kind of counterforce against the supersessionism, where there is Luther and on top of this is printer's ink, on top of it is the Angelus Novus, on top of it is Walter Benjamin's Angel of History, and on top of it is Rebecca Quaitman's painting where the angel has disappeared, and what I try to do is contribute something to this piling up of the counterforce, my reference to the work in my own book. So, 